Maxine Pullman. I'm the school sister of Notre Dame and the director of the Vista Ecological Learning Center. And I'm thrilled that so many people are here today. It's my privilege to welcome and introduce Dr. Tucker. So I was wondering what, would, what brought so many people out so early crossing the river, <laughs> some people consider the ocean to come all the way to the river. <laughs> and in my mind, there are two reasons. The first is that all of us here are deeply concerned about our planet. And we can't ignore the news about extinction of species, the effects of climate change, proliferation of plastic pollution, to name a few issues. And the second concern, or the second reason we might be here, is equally important. We're people of faith who want our religious tradition and our spirituality to speak to this deep concern. We're looking for congruence, direction, inspiration, and guidance in our anxious times. And so I know that we're in the right place this morning, and here's why. Dr. Tucker is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University, where she has appointments in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, as well as the Divinity School and the Department of Religious Studies. She teaches in the Joint Master's Program in Religion and Ecology and directs the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale with her husband, John Grimm. Her growing concern for the environmental crisis especially in Asia, led her to organize with John Grimm a series of 10 conferences on world religions and ecology at the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. Together, they are series editors for 10 volumes from these conferences. Tucker and her husband John Grimm studied world religions with Thomas Ferry in graduate school and worked closely with him for 30 years. They are the managing trustees of the Thomas Ferry Foundation. And Tucker edited several of Thomas Ferry's books. To bring Ferry's work forward, she's also worked closely with evolutionary philosopher Brian Thomas Swim for 25 years. Together, they created a multimedia project called Journey of the Universe which includes an Emmy award-winning film, which was broadcast on PBS. The companion book, which Swim and Tucker authored, is published by Yale University Press. And there's also a DVD series of 20 interviews that Tucker did with leading scientists, educators, and environmentalists entitled Journey Conversations. Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm have spoken and written extensively about the papal encyclical Laudato Si. And this is just a small glimpse <laughs> of Mary Evelyn's accomplishments and amazing contributions. It is obvious that only a deep passion and concern for our rare and precious planet could empower someone to do so much. Many of us in this room have journeyed with Mary Evelyn for many years using the resources she has created. She's been our mentor, teacher, and inspiration. We're grateful for your leadership, Mary Evelyn, especially <coughs> with the emerging field of religion and ecology. And it is an honor to welcome her today. Please join me in welcoming her. You know, it's always women who are behind these events. Yes. Can we thank Maxine again <laughs> for her wonderful leadership? and Mark as well, and all of our hosts here, and the food that we will partake of, and the First Nations who also inhabited this land. You're in the Mound country, Mississippian peoples, Cahokia peoples. It's an ancient civilization here, isn't it? In the middle of our country. And I invoke their presence, I invoke their ancestors, and I invoke the ancestors of this whole North American continent on which we dwell and have our being, as well as the lineage behind that and behind that and behind that. We live in deep time. And we have, in that incredible lineage, an astonishing moment 
in the midst of all the sad, bad news that surrounds us and drowns us and threatens to pull us under with despair, we have a pope who's quite remarkable. Let's give it up for the pope, can we? <laughs> Imagine the first time in a 2,000 year history taking the name Francis. Isn't that something? It really is amazing. So he gives us hope because of his authenticity, the way he treats everyone around the world, his apology to indigenous peoples in Latin America, all of that. It's all part of a piece and especially because the social justice and ecology are coming together. Now, I'm going to begin with something that I shared uh, last night with Judy Best, who's so kind to host me and take care of me, and you know what that means when you travel. It really is a lot. Let's thank Judy, too, can we? <laughs> so sweet. So last night I said to her, do you all know who Bill McKibben is? Yes. yes. Okay, good. We're in good company then. <laughs> so Bill, um, is a friend and I brought him to Yale in the fall because I really wanted to get our students and faculty <laughs> revved up, right, about the future. You're revved up. Next generation, and they are, and we have to have an intergenerational handshake with them, right? So Bill did this talk, a thousand people, fantastic. Next morning we have a group of maybe 20 students for breakfast with him and we started talking about the encyclical. Now Bill has read a lot of books. <coughs> Bill has written a lot of books, right? Bill has blurbed, endorsed hundreds and hundreds of books, right? He said, the encyclical is the most important document of the 21st century. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Just take that in from one of our great environmentalists. He's a Methodist. This speaks to everyone, right? That's the beauty. We've worked for so many years on ecumenism between the churches and interreligious dialogue. And finally, we can say, this is an encyclical addressed to the whole planetary community for our common home. You know, that is tremendous. Okay, so I'm going to just go through a bit of the background of this most important document of the 21st century. And we're going to be taking it in the rest of our lives. I read it on the plane last night, maybe 12 times I've read it. It's extraordinary, right? Just the way it's written. And, oh, I could go on and, and tell you of other people, I'll tell you a few. An Indian professor who's a worldwide intellectual came to Yale. He ended his talk, which was a lot of the sad, bad news, and he ended his talk that he, he's a literary figure of major proportions, he has the most hope because of the encyclical and how beautifully it's written. No, everyone can read this. Okay, so now a lot of this you'll know, but we're just taking this journey. So the goals of the encyclical, certainly it was the short term to help the Paris Agreement, right, in 2015. And by the way, we are not out of the Paris Agreement, because it doesn't, we don't go out. Good, you all know this, right, yes. until 20, okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the long term, ecological conversion, right, of people, all of us. And it's going to be an adventure for the next 100 years. So the audience then, uh, 1.2 billion Catholics, pretty amazing. Let's also remember there's a billion Muslims, there's a billion Hindus, a billion Confucians and so on, but altogether 2 billion Christians. Uh, all these other religious communities, academic communities at Yale, I'm going to tell you something about environmental communities. ESA means the Ecological Society of America and UN conferences. So every, on our forum website, every religious community has responded to this, okay, in a very positive way. And there's lots of resources on the forum website. Maybe Maxine, maybe you can send that uh, later. You know, at Yale, in the spring of 2015, this didn't come out till June, April, our dean at the oldest environmental school in the country said we have to do something. He said this all year long. We have to do something on the encyclical. Major scientist was head of Kew Botanical Gardens, the Chicago Field Museum, and so on. He's not a Catholic, not overtly religious, but in his own way. 
This is Yale, <laughs> the bastion of secularism. It is, pray for me. <laughs> it's very hard to live within this my whole academic career, where religion is really on the margins, folks, in case you didn't notice. So he, we construct this panel, standing room only, with scientists, people from the law school, people uh, from working on NGO type of thing. This is amazing for Yale. You see that they took it that seriously. It's somewhere on our website if you want to watch it as well. But even more amazing, Ecological Society of America, 10,000 scientists come to this, right? In that summer, I was at the conference in Baltimore, August, a woman president, I sat next to her at lunch, they had endorsed the papal encyclical. This is amazing for scientists, you see? 10,000 scientists saying this is so important. And the past president and future president did. I said, did you get any pushback? Scientists are not fond of religion, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> not, and no pushback, okay? This had ripple effects through all the other scientific organizations, geology and so on. Um, I could go on and on, but you know, major conferences have been uh, held on this, not only in the US, but all over the world. And obviously, we're having a wonderful one here at St. Louis uh, University. Now, I'm going to um, also just give a little shout out. We love <laughs> Francis, I have to say. But, you know, um, our earlier pope uh, did have an encyclical that was a hundred years after Rerum Novarum, right? I mean, social justice teaching came out of Rerum Novarum, the care for the poor. And he was trying to deal with this problem of dominion and saying we need to move towards stewardship. I think we have to move even further <laughs> from, you know, we're not in control here, right? This is a biocentric mentality we have to move towards, right? But cooperative labor. So we have a history here um, in the tradition moving forward. And that's what uh, Francis picks up on. You know, he's quoting the early popes, but he's quoting bishops from all over the world. It's extraordinary. Um, even Benedict, who was sometimes called the Green Pope, right? So he has <coughs> in his Caritas in Veritate this duty to the poor, responsibility to, and by the way, I'll make these slides available, so don't feel you have to, you know, worry about notes, but responsibility to future generations, the wise use of nature. He speaks, he actually held up Teilhard several times, right? So the grammar of nature, this notion Nature is not a collection of objects, but a communion of subjects. Almost everyone knows that line, right, of Thomas Berry. It's in the encyclical in a variety of ways. The subjectivity, if we could just come to the incarnational reality of the natural world. This is what Teilhard was inviting us to, the hymn of the universe. You see, it's all right here as background for this encyclical. That's what's so exciting. Um, Okay, now, how many of you know about the ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew? You know, the name might not be the best, <laughs> um, the patriarch, but, um, but <laughs> he is quite a wonderful person. He's really quite extraordinary. And he's been a huge influence on the Pope, both for apology to indigenous peoples and so on, um, and for his writing of all kinds of statements on ecological sin, Crimes Against Creation. Um, he did the symposium, Religion, Science, and the Environment, Symposium on Water. By the way, would it help to turn the lights down so you can see it better? I think that might be, yeah, a good idea. Didn't want to put anyone to sleep, but. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so he did these symposium, there were about eight. We went on about five. They were focused on water. Uh, the sacrality of water, but he brought NGO people, brought scientists, he brought UN people, mm -hmm. EU people, uh, and absolutely extraordinary. In Venice, um, and in, there was a huge service for the environment. In Ravenna, it was the first time the Catholic and the Orthodox Church were together in like 800 years. It was incredible. So you see the potential here for ecumenism and so on is amazing. And if you note, He's quoting Bartholomew right at the beginning of the encyclical, saying he's hoping for that kind of union. <coughs> so here is on the Amazon, where we were all out on boats in the middle of the Amazon, and the patriarch apologized to indigenous peoples. That was one of the very first um, that, that I know of. 
And the indigenous peoples, you know, ceremonially accepted the apology. Amazing. Um, now, his influence came from this very deep mystical theologian, John Zazulus, who spent years in prayer and in writing and really understood what's coming to all of us now. This livingness, the icon of the earth, the, the luminosity of this sacred universe. I mean, you're living next to the Mississippi River, right? One of the greatest watersheds on the North American continent. If you see this as watershed, it takes up a third of, of the country. It's extraordinary. So he had that very deep feeling for sacrality. And I want to point out, this next little section is, who was there in June when it was announced at the Vatican? This theologian of the Orthodox Church. Isn't that amazing? Quite extraordinary. John Zazulus, who spoke first. And <coughs> this whole idea in chapter 2 of the gospel of creation, the promise, right? taken very much from a variety of sources, but this mystery of the universe, the harmony of creation in each creature, the interdependence of life, universal communion, the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all, sorry that's cut off, um, but this mystical sensibility coming from all of our Christian traditions, but I just wanted to highlight that the Orthodox is very, very important, okay? Now, who else was there? This is um, John Joachim Schulnuber, head of the Potsdam Institute on Climate Scientists. Over 2,000 climate scientists there. It's one of the largest in the world. We went there uh, two falls ago, a year and a half ago. He, and as you know, many scientists helped the Pope with the encyclical. The, some of them are going to be here at this conference. Certainly Peter Raven, your own, um, helped a lot. But, um, but he was there to represent the scientists, okay? And if you note, this whole encyclical begins with science. How important is that? You're all aware there's a huge march for science last weekend, right? So the Pope is affirming we can't do this without science. We absolutely need it. And I can tell you, some of the scientists we know are in deep despair because their science is not being understood, much less funded. That's another issue. Twelve years ago, we went to a conference in Aspen. <coughs> These scientists who were in such despair, it was before Al Gore's movie, and some, some of them were deeply into Jungian analysis because they were like, they are living, you see, with a knowledge that most of us here who are not scientists is overwhelming about what's happening to our planet. We have to pray for them too, you know? So we begin, he begins with the problems to get us revved up to get us realistic. And he says, the pollution and climate change. And by the way, a lot of people say this is an encyclical about climate change. It is an encyclical, right, about the whole of the environment. Um, climate change is one huge issue. So is biodiversity loss, and he holds that up. And he holds up toxicities and the Flint, Michigans of our world, and so on and so forth. So water is hugely important. This biodiversity loss, how many of you are aware we're in a sixth extinction period, right? I mean, Thomas Berry said this 30 years ago. We are losing species at incredible rate. Where are our churches? This is God's creation, <laughs> you know? It's, it's truly incredible. And who's the most famous scientist on the planet? Jane Goodall, because she recognized these incredible chimps and their intelligence. You know, we are getting the sense of sentience, intelligences, language between dolphins and fish and migrating patterns. This is subjectivity, you see? This is the inner form of the natural world. It's a living world, you see? That is our best way forward, and I mean our best way forward, recognizing the profound, differentiated sentience the soul of the world. We're not the only ones with souls or intelligence and so on, you see? And the science world is giving us amazing understanding of animal communication, fish communication. So 
we get into what we all know of the breakdown of society, the quality of life. You're dealing with it here in St. Louis. Every major city in the country is dealing with this, um, with inequities and so on. We're in a big moment, aren't we? Yeah. Really big moment. But I just, I'm saying we begin with the problems. I'm just going to flip back. And then we go immediately to the promise. You see? That's the genius of this encyclical. So we awaken. We have to be awake. We have to bear this suffering somehow. And then we go to the promise of this magnificent universe. And that we have in place now this understanding of an evolutionary story, you see, that can carry us through. Um, okay, so we have the problems and the promise. Now, Turkson is going to be at this conference. He's the third person who was there. So he's speaking for the church. We have scientists and we have an orthodox theologian. It's amazing. Um, now, he is speaking especially for the human roots of the ecological crisis, the Pontifical Academy of uh, Justice and Peace and so on. So, this is where the analysis of the encyclical is so profound. The crisis and the effects of modern anthropocentrism, right? The human domination of our planet is so profound. And he corrects, or he critiques the Pope, this technocratic paradigm. We all get this, yeah. right? <laughs> I don't have to, some of this I don't even have to explain, you know. Um, so technology is not going to solve all these problems. And he says this, boing. Now, I'm at a school that thinks only science and policy and technology and some economics is going to solve this. And that's the dominant paradigm you see in academia. That's why this is so important. And it's so important because one policy person whose office is right opposite mine, I said to him in the summer, what did you think of the encyclical? <laughs> oh, the Pope didn't go for cap and trade. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you missed the big picture. <laughs> and he comes back from Paris. And we, in January, we have a panel discussion at the school and large audience. He starts it. I follow, and he holds up the encyclical and he says, this is why we got an agreement in Paris. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. Amazing. So here we have a critique, you see, of our educational system, sort of science, engineering, policy, and so on, of our whole mental idea of anthropocentrism, humans dominate, and the objectification of nature and humans. He keeps putting this together, right? Nature and humans. Unlimited growth and extraction equals progress. This is what Thomas Berry said years ago. We're in the technological trance. We're in wonder world where we think more and more is going to give us both happiness, more stuff. <coughs> Why is our next generation so alienated? Why do we have an opioid crisis and on and on? Why do we have addictions? We are so disconnected from this sacred universe. And that's what I say Thomas Berry has so guided our life and so inspired this, as you know. And that's where this new story, everyone's talking now, we need a new story, we need a new narrative. Uh, <clears throat> and the Pope is calling for a cultural revolution. Now, you gotta, it's not just a Maoist cultural revolution. We're talking here, the major change because we know the science, we know what can be done technologically. We've got some good industrial technology, we've got good alternative energies. Technology it itself isn't bad, it's how we use it. But we do need a new story, clearly. And I want to say, I know not all of you are from religious communities here, but the religious communities have held this idea of a new story more than any other community. I think, in our country and in many other parts of the world. I thank you for that. Let's celebrate that, too. <laughs> and Thomas Berry was very grateful for that. We all are. John, my husband, and Brian Swim. Now, this Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace that Turkson set is head of, the moral imperative of all peoples is to be protectors of the environment. So all peoples care for creation as a virtue in its own right. You know, if we continue to think our salvation, our virtues, our spiritual development is the be-all and the end-all, of course it's foundational. But we're talking about 
cultivation in relation to all living beings, which is why Thomas Berry's term, the Earth community, is so important, right? Um, so the need for a global solidarity to direct our search for the common good. And again, we are society, and the West has held up individualism almost to a fault. Of course individualism is terrific. I study Confucianism. Chinese society, it's the oldest tradition in the world, influenced more people than any other tradition. Sorry to say it's older than Christianity. <laughs> um, and it's communitarian. Their sense of spiritual cultivation is for a common good. There's problems. There's, there's problems on either extreme, right? Individualism and communitarianism. We've got to get a new mix. We've got to invite the next generation into the great work for a common good, and they are dying to do it. All we have to do is step aside and say, come forward. We are so inspired with these students at Yale. They're not giving up hope. They have their own ingenuity. It's so exciting, and we've got to em empower them that way. Okay, you all know Boff, right? So Boff, you know, years ago, Thomas Berry said to him, well, Leonardo, of course, liberation is key, but liberation for people, necessary, but not sufficient. So Leonardo picked up this whole idea, as you know, that people and planet need to go together. And his influence in Latin America, almost bar none. So he did this cry of the earth, cry of the poor, right? In this series that we've been editing on ecology and justice that has Brian Swims, Hidden Heart, Thomas Berry's Christian Future, Earth Community, Earth Ethics, Larry Rassman, Just Water, Native American Defending Mother Earth. But Leonardo's book, I think it was 88 even that it came out. And in that book, he's bringing together the sense of new story and justice for the poor. This is central, central theme in the encyclical, right? So we come to chapter four. Now, I love this term, integral ecology. You know, it's really a good term. I know Ken Wilber uses it and so on and so forth, but um, why is it good? Because it brings together ecology, economics, and equity. You just put those three words together. And see, our school of the environment's been all about nature. The divinity school, about social justice. And they don't see until very recently how these come together. So the principle of the common good, solidarity with the poor, intergenerational justice, all of this chapter is bringing Catholic social teachings forward uh, to expand it to the earth. How exciting is that? How much theological and ethical work is ahead of us, as well as just putting it in action? You don't have to read one more book, <laughs> in a way, you know, to do this, although it deepens our mind and our hearts and our spirits. Um, so we are next, he, this is exactly what he calls us to, of action, of approach and action. Um, it should be dialogue up there. But dialogue is international, it's national, and it's local. And this is true. Those of you are, some of you from SSND, is an international order. You know, we are living in the formation of a truly planetary community for the first time. I lived in England and... 68, 69, I called home once. I lived in Japan in 73, 74 at, at the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur taught at their school. Called home once. You know, you know this. Mm -hmm. We are in an amazing moment. How exciting is that? You know, we got on a plane a year or so ago. We're in Istanbul. We had been in Iran for a conference on the environment and religions by the government and UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, get in this plane in the airport, our Hasidic Jews coming from Passover in Israel, the Turkish airline stewards fed us, we had uh, Hasidic food, we had <laughs> um, kosher food, we had Muslims, Christians, and Jews all on this plane, landed in New York. We can do this. We can do this, you know. So, this notion of dialogue that's happening all over the world, and it, you can say whatever you like about the UN, but it has created the most intense dialogue on every level, and that's going to contribute to the future. 
So the politics and economy for human fulfillment, not just for individualism, re redefining progress and development, I think you all know that, religion and science coming together, a common home, interreligious and interdisciplinary. We couldn't have had a conference like this at St. Louis University 10 years ago, certainly not 20. So this is very exciting. Um, I'm sorry this, um, but ecological education and spirituality, the last chapter. So he's inviting us into a new synthesis, a new lifestyle with a web of relations. This is a covenant between humanity and nature, again, ecological conversion. I'm citing Loyola University in Chicago because um, at, at that university is a scientist, I'm trying to think of her last name, Nancy, she's gonna be there. Um, and she, she's not Catholic, she is the one who has helped to convene the Jesuit colleges and universities around the encyclical. And for the last maybe four or five years even, she's helped bring a scientist and someone from the theology department. I've gone to a few of these, it's magnificent. The Jesuits, as you know, have the largest educational system in the world, 260 colleges and universities, 2,600 high schools and so on. As this is going in, and it is, it will be massively transformative. Absolutely transformative. <coughs> so, Francis, I'll just do a, a few more slides here and then we'll open it up to some discussion. Um, the spirituality of Francis in the encyclical is clear. Begins with Mother Earth, Canticle to Brother Sun and Sister Moon, Bonaventure, you all know <coughs> mind's path to God, goes through the natural world. And so much of this is awe-evoking action. You know, we're looking for renewable energy. The renewable energy is the energy of the spirit to renew the face of the earth. And that's where religious communities, spiritual sensibilities, moral force will make a difference. It's the missing link in all of this. You have a very special role. A reverence that evokes responsibility. Again, you know what reverence is. You spent your whole life, many of you, devoted to that idea. Kinship evokes universal solidarity. Coming right out of social justice, but kinship for everything, everybody, <laughs> rocks, plants, stones, fish, birds, uh, people. Okay, Teilhard, sorry that picture is grainy, but do we all love Teilhard here? <laughs> Let's give it up for Teilhard. <laughs> I mean, you think, each one of you has your path of suffering and, and uh, difficulties. What did he go through, right? Totally misunderstood. Exile in China for years. Died uh, a bit, you know, not alone, but in New York. 71, May 1st is, um, May 1st is his birthday. Uh, you know, when we did a celebration for him 50 years after his death, which was 1955, a thousand people came to the UN, including 200 from France, the head of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, Cam Dessou is head of the IMF. The next day at the cathedral, we had 1,400 all over New York, at Fordham and so on. There were events celebrating terror. Isn't that amazing? If we're remembered five years after we go, it's pretty <laughs> good. Uh, but so, you know, something extraordinary. You all had it from, I'm sure. And, and Probably, I read it in high school, who understood it when you're that young, you know? We grow into Teilhard, and we continue to grow into him. Um, Thomas Berry, we're clapping for everybody, so let's do it for Thomas. <laughs> um, so, don't you love that wild picture, his hair and everything? So, most of you, I'm sure, know who he is and have read at least one of his books, and I almost don't need to say anything more. Let me see if there's one slide, oh, no. So, um, I'm gonna, I think I'll end with Thomas Berry. The rest is just talking about Journey of the Universe, which I think you know. But what I'm saying is behind this encyclical are these two people who are not overtly present, although Teilhard is mentioned in a footnote, right? And, but this presence of a massive understanding of a 14 billion year universe that has gifted us with life, with the spring that is coming. I just took a walk, you know, the 
Bartlett pears and the flowering trees and so on, brings us all to life again, yes? All of this comes out of such deep time. What a gift. And that Thomas could take Teilhard and say, we need a story, because Teilhard is heavy in some ways. Too. And that he did this in 1978, right, the new story. And that that is going forward. We're writing his biography right now, John and I. Columbia will publish it next year. In these times, it's one of the most inspiring things that we are doing because you especially will appreciate his otter didn't understand him, right? He just persisted. His, his otter was not a teaching otter, you see, and, and so on. So I just want to say we all have our oppositions. We all find ways around things. Teilhard did. Thomas Berry did. Pope Francis is doing it. And what an offering to all future generations this encyclical is. Let's clap for Pope Francis and this encyclical. <laughs>
um, we're also bringing this forward from the tradition. And as you know, the Francis, in the beginning of the encyclical and throughout, he takes bishop letters from all over the world to emphasize this point. In other words, this isn't, he's very strategic, it's quite brilliant. This isn't just coming from me, the bishop. Well, it comes from the universe, okay? And that's why the cosmic Christ is so important. And I love your point. Okay, now I see the hands starting to fly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Why are the bishops so quiet on this issue? And pastors and preaching. And pastors and preaching. Why is it the women are here? Sorry, several good gentlemen as well, our allies. Um, it changes everything. This changes everything. The origin story, Genesis. Um, you know, I look. I looked on the board, the other <laughs> topics in this series. This is quite out of the <laughs> traditional uh, mindset, right? So, but you know what? It doesn't take, we don't have to have a billion Catholics on board for this. We don't have to have a bi two billion Christians. It takes a critical mass, and that's what Margaret Mead said, you know, a few people, possibility. I have utter conviction in that, utter conviction. So let's not worry too much because change happens with a certain process called entropy into another <laughs> state of being. You get my point? Yes. We're going to have new generations here. Yeah. And there's talk about renewal that happened after Vatican II. That was massive and difficult. This is even more critical probably more difficult, but we have, we have resources now, you see, and we have the ideas and energy among communities like you. We're not bereft. We're not bereft. We don't have to look for leadership on this issue from the hierarchy. We simply don't, okay? This is a jump start by somebody like Francis, but the church is the laity. <laughs> okay, who else? You know, yeah. Who knows? I keep saying the universe is what is guiding us. The universe will take care of its future. And that is what I think we can trust. Um, and I see a signal over there that looks like <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the hook. <laughs> the universe. And I want to thank you all for being here and for praying for these issues for all of us. <laughs>